Chapter Two, Part Two of the Markets of Paris by Emile Zola. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Miser's Treasure, Part Two. The house and shop both prospered. One daughter was born a year after their marriage. Everything went smoothly, as Lisa was an excellent manager and her system was perfect. Husband, wife, and child grew fat together. Quenu alone had his hours of sadness when he thought of poor Florent in eighteen fifty six letters came to him then followed a long silence and quenu saw by the papers that three convicts had been drowned in attempting to make their escape from the ile du diable he applied to the head of police but could learn no further particulars his brother was probably dead and yet he cherished a gleam of hope florent who was wandering in dutch guiana delayed writing as he determined each day to start on the next for france Quenu at last made up his mind that his brother was dead. Lisa had never known Florent, but she listened kindly to all her husband had to say. She heard him describe for the hundredth time the room in la rue Royer-Collard, where the brothers had lived together, the innumerable trades he had tried, the dishes he cooked on the stove. She listened quietly, with infinite sympathy. It was amid these placid joys that Florent fell one September morning, just as Lisa stood in the doorway, basking in the morning sun. Husband and wife were thoroughly upset. Gavard insisted that the convict, as he called him, should be concealed at once. Lisa, paler and graver than usual, showed him to a room on the fifth floor. Quenu cut some slices of bread and ham, but Florent could hardly eat. He was utterly worn out and remained in bed for nearly a week with symptoms of brain fever which were energetically and successfully combated when he was better he saw lisa at his bedside with a spoon and cup in her hand he tried to thank her but she gently bade him keep quiet that he was not to talk at present when at last he was able to leave his bed and his room quenu came up for him and took him downstairs where they occupied a small suite consisting of three rooms and a closet there was first an unfurnished room then a small salon the furniture of which was always shrouded in white draperies but dimly seen as the curtains were closely drawn that the light should not fade the pale blue of the walls then came the bedroom where they lived this was comfortably furnished in mahogany the bed was marvellous to behold with its fine mattresses its fine pillows and its eider-down spread and the air of absolute sleepiness which hung over it it was a bed in which it was impossible not to sleep the armoire à glace the toilette table the crochet cover on the guéridon the chairs protected by squares of guipure gave the place a look of bourgeois luxury against the wall on the left on either side of the chimney-piece which was ornamented with vases on brass stands and with a clock representing a gutenberg with his finger on his lip buried in thought were hung portraits in oil of quenu and lisa in oval and highly ornamented frames quenu smiled lisa had quite a modish air both were in black with very pink and white complexions a moquette carpet with complicated garlands of flowers intermingled with golden stars concealed the polished floor before the bed lay one of those soft rugs made of ravelled carpet the result of a patient labour of la belle lisa as she sat behind her counter a very odd effect was produced amid all these modern things by a gigantic secretary black with age which stood against the wall it had been varnished but nothing could rejuvenate it lisa wished to keep this piece of furniture which uncle gradelle had used for more than forty years she said it would bring good luck it had a most formidable aspect with its enormous locks and was so heavy that it was almost impossible to move it when florent and quenu entered Lisa was seated before the let-down leaf of the secretary, writing. She was adding up long columns of figures in a hand that was round and very legible. She made a little sign to signify that they were not to speak to her. The two men sat down in silence. Florent looked around the room at the bed, the two portraits, and the clock. "'Now then,' said Lisa, at last having verified her accounts, "'listen to me. "'We have some business to settle with you, my dear Florent.' This was the first time she had thus addressed him. She continued, Your uncle Gradel died without a will. You and your brother were the two sole heirs. Today we are ready to give you your share. But I ask nothing, exclaimed Florent, 
In fact, I want nothing. Quenu was in ignorance of his wife's intention. He turned a little pale and looked at her with an air of vexation. He was sincerely attached to his brother, but it struck him as unnecessary to throw his uncle's money at him in this way. I know very well, dear Florent, resumed Lisa, that you did not come back with any intention of claiming that which belongs to you. Only business is business, and we had best get through with it at once. Your uncle's savings amounted to eighty-five thousand francs. I have, therefore, put down to your credit forty-two thousand five hundred francs. Please look at this. And she showed him the paper. It is, unfortunately, not as easy to put a value on the shop, stock, and business. I can only guess at this, but I have put it all down at fifteen thousand three hundred and ten francs, which will give you seven thousand six hundred and fifty-five francs. Please add these columns up and she gave him another sheet of paper. But, cried Quenu, the old man's shop was not worth fifteen thousand francs. I would not have given ten thousand for it. His wife exasperated him. It was folly to push honesty to such a point as this. Florent would never have thought of the shop. Why had she not let it alone? The shop was worth fifteen thousand three hundred and ten francs, answered Lisa, in an imperturbable tone. You understand, my dear Florent, that it is unnecessary for us to employ a lawyer to arrange our matters. We are entirely ready to give you your share. I thought of this as soon as you came, and while you were ill I went over our accounts, and I have made it all clear to myself, and I hope to you. Ask any questions you please. I have all the data here. Florent smiled. He was touched by this probity. He laid the paper on the lap of La Belle Lisa, and took her hand in his. My dear Lisa, he said, I am happy to see that you are so prosperous, but I do not want this money. You and my brother should be the sole heirs, for you too took care of him to the last. I need nothing, and I do not wish to disturb your business. She insisted, even became angry, while Quenu sat gnawing his thumbs in vexed silence. Ah, answered Florent, smiling, if Uncle Gradel should hear you. He is quite capable of coming back to this world and taking his money again. He never liked me, you know. No, indeed, he never liked you, murmured Quenu, who could stand it no longer. But Lisa declared that she did not care to have the responsibility of money that was not her own. And Florent asked if she would not allow him to invest his money in her eating shop. He added that he was quite willing to accept a little for immediate use as he needed an entire outfit. Of course, said Quenu, you will live here, you will eat, and we will provide you with all you need. That is understood. Quenu was quite touched, and declared he would take on himself the duty of making his brother as fat as himself, but Florent shook his head. Lisa, in the meantime, had closed her account books and replaced them in the secretary. You make a great mistake, both of you, she said firmly, but I have done all I could. Now you must go your own way but pray let us have no arguments. They worry me too much. They discussed other matters now. It was necessary to give some explanation of Florent's return. He told them that he had come back to France on the papers of a poor fellow who had died in his arms of yellow fever at Surinam. Singularly enough, this youth was also named Florent, Florent La Carrière, and had only one cousin in Paris. Nothing was easier than to assume this man's identity. Lisa agreed to be the cousin. It was decided, therefore, that he should be described as the cousin returned from foreign parts, and hospitably entertained by the Quenu Gradels, as the household was called in the quartier, until he could find a position. That evening Florent was freshly arrayed all in black, contrary to the wishes of Quenu, who said that it was most dreary. There was no attempt made to conceal the newcomer, and Lisa made constant allusions to her cousin. He wandered from the shop to the kitchen and back again. Quenu fretted at the table because he ate so little and left on his plate half of what was placed there. Lisa was as calm and placid as ever, did not in any way object to his presence, not even in the morning when he was really very much in the way. She forgot him, in fact, so entirely at times that when he suddenly appeared before her she started quickly. But this start was immediately followed by a sweet smile. She was very much impressed by the disinterestedness of this man, 
and felt for him great respect not unmingled with a vague fear florent enjoyed the affection by which he was surrounded at bedtime he went upstairs a little wearied by the emptiness of his day two youths employed in the shop inhabited attic rooms by the side of his own one of them leon the apprentice was not more than fifteen he was a real child who with the most innocent air in the world helped himself surreptitiously to every stray sausage or bit of meat on which he could lay his hand he hid them under his bed and ate them during the night many a time in the middle of the night florent fancied that leon was giving a supper he heard whispers and the noise of eating rustling of paper and a rippling laugh a child's laugh like the soft trill of a flageolet the other fellow auguste landois was from troyes and very stout with an enormous head and bald although he was not twenty-eight the first evening that florent was there this fellow told his story in a long confused way he had only come to paris to learn the business and had intended to return shortly to troyes where he intended to open an eating-house and where his cousin augustine landois was waiting for him they had had the same godparents and bore the same names but now he had been bitten by ambition and wished to settle in paris and there used to his advantage the small inheritance he had received from his mother auguste said many pleasant things of madame quenu he said she was most kind and had consented to his sending for augustine to take the place of a girl in her shop who had turned out ill he had learned his trade and now she was learning hers in a year or eighteen months they would marry and establish themselves somewhere in paris they were in no haste to marry because business had not been good that year he then told how they had been photographed together at a fete he went into florent's room to show his photograph which he thought the girl had left behind when she vacated this room which had been hers he held the candle high up as he said that augustine would be much better off downstairs for the attics were cold in winter then he went off leaving florent alone opposite the photograph auguste was only another quenu augustine an unripe lisa florent liked by these young men adored by his brother and quietly accepted by lisa was in fact utterly ennuyé he had endeavoured to obtain pupils but without success particularly as out of fear of being recognised he did not dare apply at any schools lisa gently suggested that he should apply to some mercantile houses for a position as corresponding clerk she adhered to this idea and finally offered to look for such a situation herself as she began to feel a certain annoyance at finding him lounging about and always under her feet at first she felt only a mild dislike for a person who folded his arms and waited for the bread to fall into his mouth she had not yet begun to reproach him in her own mind for eating of their food i could not swallow a mouthful she would say if i dreamed all day long as you do it would take away my appetite gavard also looked for a situation for florent but his efforts were made in the most mysterious way he wished beside to find something dramatic some employment especially suited to a convict gavard was a man of the opposition he was not much over fifty but he boasted of having seen four governments charles x the priests and the nobles he stigmatized as rabble louis philippe was an imbecile with his bourgeois talk and he told the story of the woollen hose in which the citizen king concealed his money as to the republic of forty eight it was a farce wherein the workmen had been deceived he did not say however that he approved of the second of december because he now regarded napoleon the third as his personal enemy a man who shut himself up with de morny and that crew to commit all sorts of enormities he was extremely diffuse on this point and dropped his voice as he affirmed that every night close carriages filled with women drove to the tuileries and that he himself had often heard the noise of their orgies gavard's religion was to be as disagreeable as possible to the government he voted for the candidate which would be most embarrassing to the ministry and did his best to lead the police astray in any of their political investigations and to give them a most incendiary character he talked with an air of great importance as if the tuileries set had known and trembled before him and swore he could have half of them guillotined and the other half transported 
all his noisy political chatter was pervaded by the same spirit which induces a parisian shopkeeper to open his shutters on a day of a fight at the barricades to see the dead bodies consequently when florent returned from cayenne he immediately set himself to plan some way in which he might safely flout at the emperor and ministry and at all the men in office down to the very sergeants in the police force gavard gloried in florent's companionship it was like a forbidden pleasure he winked at him and told him the simplest thing in a sepulchral whisper and pressed his hand in the most significant way at last he had an adventure he had a companion who was really compromised and he was now able without making his statement out of whole cloth to talk of the danger that he run he felt a certain fear withal in the face of this man who had escaped from prison and whose haggard face and worn frame told of sufferings and privations but this fear was delicious after all and convinced him that he had really done an astonishing thing in welcoming as a friend a man who was as compromising as florent florent was now sacred to him he swore by florent and florent's name rose to his lips whenever he wished to give an instance of the importance of the government gavard had lost his wife some months after the coup d'etat but he kept his cook-shop until eighteen fifty six at this time the belief was current that he had made considerable money in connection with a grocer in the neighbourhood by furnishing dried fruits to the army in the east but the truth was that after he sold out his business he for a year lived on his income but he did not care to allude to the origin of his fortune for it prevented him from expressing his opinion of the crimean war which he stigmatized as an adventurous expedition invented merely to consolidate the throne and fill certain pockets at the end of a year he was frightfully bored by his bachelor life and quarters and as he was in the habit of calling on the connu gradels almost daily he ended by establishing himself very near them then the halle fascinated him and he determined to take a stall in the poultry market merely to fill up the emptiness of his days and to hear all the gossip of the market here he was in his element and enjoyed the constant chatter immensely florent often went there to see him the middle of the day was still warm the women sat picking their poultry in the sunshine the feathers looking like snow falling from their fingers questions and entreaties followed florent as he walked through the narrow path a fine pair of ducks sir come and let me show you chickens as fat as butter won't you buy this pair of pigeons he passed on with a half impatient frown and the woman picked all the faster the thick down filled the air already heavy with the odour of the poultry about the middle of the alley near the fountain was gavard in his shirt-sleeves his arms folded over the bib of his blue apron holding forth to ten or more women over whom he reigned he being the only man in the poultry market he had quarrelled with five or six girls one after the other whom he had employed to keep his stall and finally decided to sell his merchandise himself saying that these fools spent their whole day in chattering as it was necessary however that some one should take his place when he was away he engaged marjolin who was generally out of a situation florent was always amused and always astonished at gavard's incessant chatter and at his entire self-possession among all these petticoats interrupting one quarrelling with another ten stalls off making more noise himself than did all the others put together gavard's family consisted only of a sister-in-law and a niece when his wife died her elder sister madame lecoeur who had been a widow for a year was perfectly inconsolable and went every evening to console the bereaved and miserable husband she unquestionably had at that time the idea of becoming the successor of the dear deceased but gavard hated thin women thin cats and thin dogs and madame lecoeur furious at seeing the comfortable fortune slip through her fingers absolutely hated him and soon learned to regard her brother-in-law as her absolute enemy she occupied herself entirely with his comings and goings when she saw him take this stall only a few steps from the place where she sold butter cheese and eggs she accused him of having done it merely to tease her and bring her ill luck she made such a fuss and took this so much to heart that she ended by losing much of her custom for some time she had with her daughter one of her sisters a peasant woman the child grew up in the midst of the market as her family name was sarriette she was soon called la sarriette 
at sixteen la serviette was so bewilderingly beautiful that gentlemen went to buy her cheese merely to look at her she cared little for these gentlemen she claimed to be of the people and made her selection from among them it was a porter whom this brunette with a virgin-like face and starry eyes a porter whom she chose at twenty she was established at the halles as a fruit merchant and her lover m jules wore the freshest of blouses and a velvet cap and sauntered into the market late in the day they lived together in la rue vauvilleur on the third floor of a great house la sarriette's ingratitude was the last touch of bitterness in the cup of madame lecoeur who reproached her niece vehemently they quarrelled the niece amused herself at her aunt's expense with m jules who repeated all her witticisms at market gavard thought la sarriette very droll and showed himself full of indulgence toward her he tapped her on her cheek when he met her she was plump and had a skin like satin one afternoon as florent was in the shop greatly fatigued by the long walk he had taken marjolin came in this great stolid fellow was lisa's especial protege she said he was not bad in any way that he was a little dull possibly but that his strength was almost incredible that he was a treasure to his employers it was she who insisting that he had neither father nor mother had induced gavard to take him into his employment lisa was at the counter annoyed by the dirty shoes of florent which had left spots on the marble tessellated floor twice she had thrown down sawdust she smiled at marjolin who said in a low mysterious whisper looking around to see that he was not heard monsieur gavard wishes me to say just these words to you is there any danger and can he talk with you on matters that you know of say to monsieur gavard that we shall expect him answered lisa so accustomed to his mysterious ways that she was quite undisturbed by them but marjolin still lingered with adoring eyes fixed on the fair mistress of the establishment touched by this silent adoration she said i hope you give entire satisfaction to monsieur gavard he is a good man and you must try and please him yes madame lisa she turned away to wait on a lady who had come to buy a pound of côtelette au cornichon she left the counter and went to the chopping block at the back of the shop where with a sharp knife she cut three cutlets from a piece of pork then with a wooden mallet she gave the cutlets each three sharp decisive blows all this lisa did with a rather serious air when the lady was gone lisa was astonished to see that marjolin was still there what not gone she said he turned to depart but she detained him listen to me she said hastily i saw you and cadine together again this morning and i really cannot understand how a good-looking fellow like yourself can waste so much time or be seen with that little scapegrace that is all go quickly and tell m gavard that he can come here at once while there is no one here marjolin went off with an air of confusion while la belle lisa stood leaning on her counter and looking out toward the halle florent gazed at her wonderstruck at her beauty before her on white china plates were sausages from al and lyon tongues and small square bits of salt pork a pig's head surrounded with jelly boxes of sardines floating in oil blood-red hams and hams that were pale rose in hue galantine truffer boar's heads aux pistaches and in yellow pots pâté de foie and pâté de lièvre as gavard did not come she mechanically rearranged these dishes and then again waited the whiteness of her cuffs and her apron rivalled the whiteness of her dishes florent looked at her reflection in the mirrors even on the ceiling he saw her he was in fact surrounded with a crowd of lisas all as plump and as placid as the meats before her gavard appeared and at once went to find quenu in the kitchen and then returning to the shop he announced in the presence of lisa quenu and florent that he had found a situation for the latter he interrupted himself however in the full tide of his discourse on seeing mademoiselle saget appear she from the sidewalk had caught a glimpse of the little circle the old lady in her faded dress and carrying as usual her shabby black reticule wearing a black straw bonnet guiltless of ribbons which threw a heavy shadow on her pale face smiled at lisa and bowed slightly to the men this little old lady was an enigma to the neighborhood although she had lived forty years in la rue pirouette she never said where she came from though once she made an incautious allusion to cherbourg as if she were born there 
but this was all no one knew more she talked incessantly but only of other people knew the most intimate details of their daily life peeped into the letters and listened at the doors of her neighbours her tongue was dreaded throughout the quartier where she roamed all day long with her empty reticule pretending that she was buying her provisions but in reality buying nothing but picking up all sorts of gossip quenu had always declared her to be the person who had spread the story of uncle gradelle's dying in the kitchen she had always felt an extreme interest in uncle gradelle and the quenus and for a fortnight had suffered agonies of curiosity from florent's arrival she felt certain that she had seen him somewhere she stood before the counter and looked first at one dish and then at another i declare she said it is impossible to know what to eat nowadays i really have no appetite have you any breaded cutlets madame quenu without waiting for a reply she raised a cover yes mademoiselle saget said lisa i think i have one cutlet left well never mind said the old lady i think a breaded cutlet is almost too heavy this evening besides i should rather have something i should not be obliged to warm up she drew nearer florent as she spoke and looked first at him and then at gavard who was beating a devil's tattoo on the marble table why don't you have a bit of this salt pork asked lisa a bit of pork yes i suppose and she took up a fork and tried the thickness of each piece in the plate and yet i do not know then take a tongue a bit of the head or a slice of larded veal answered lisa patiently but mademoiselle saget shook her head and made a little face of disgust at each one of the dishes and coming to the conclusion that she should discover nothing she departed saying she should come in another day lisa watched her cross the street and enter a fruit stall and then turning to gavard she said quietly go on gavard began to describe the place he had found for florent there was quite a little story attached to it one of his friends m valoque inspector of fish was out of health and was obliged to take a vacation the poor man had said to him that very morning that he wished to find a substitute himself so that in case he was cured he could have his place back again you understand said gavard that in my opinion valoque won't live six months if florent is satisfactory he can keep the place and it will be delicious to bamboozle the police think of florent having money from these people this view of the situation struck him as so deliciously comic that he burst into a shout of laughter i do not wish this position said florent i have sworn to accept nothing from the empire i would die with hunger rather than do it it is absolutely impossible gavard do you hear gavard heard and was far from pleased quenu was silent also but lisa turned and looked at florent whose nostrils dilated with indignation as he spoke at this moment la sarriette came i forgot to buy some pork she cried madame quenu cut me twelve slips very slender for my larks jules wants some larks to-day she seemed to fill the shop with her rustling skirts she smiled at every one in succession gavard took her hand in his and she said boldly you were talking of me uncle when i came in i know it well lisa called her are these slips slender enough she said and as she wrapped them in paper she added do you want anything else yes as long as i am here you may give me a pound of leaf lard for i adore fried potatoes my best breakfast is a bunch of radishes and two sous worth of fried potatoes lisa put a sheet of stout paper on the scales she took the lard from a pot with a wooden spatula and weighed out the pound she gave the paper a deft twist twenty-four sous she said is there anything more la sarriette shook her head and laughed with a glance at the men she wore a shabby grey gown and a red fichu loosely knotted around her throat before she went out she shook her finger lightly at gavard saying then you won't tell me what you were talking about when i came in i saw you all laughing i think you very selfish to keep all your fun to yourself she left the shop and ran across the street la belle lisa said dryly mademoiselle saget sent her gavard was considerably disturbed by florent's reception of his proposition and would not speak 
it was lisa who broke the silence by saying in a friendly voice you are wrong florent in refusing this position you know how hard it is to find employment in these days you should not be so fastidious i have given my reasons he answered she shrugged her shoulders yes she replied i know very well that you do not like the government but that is no reason why you should refuse to earn your bread and after all the emperor is not a bad man my dear do you suppose he knew that you eat mouldy bread and spoiled meat he can't know everything of course you are unjust gavard rebelled at hearing these faint praises of the emperor no no madame quenu he exclaimed you are going too far they are a set of rascals oh interrupted lisa you are never happy unless you are talking politics and i hate them they always make me angry besides they have nothing to do with florent what have you to say quenu quenu cautiously replied to his wife's abrupt questions it would be a very good thing perhaps and another long silence fell on the little circle pray said florent at last pray say no more about this my mind is made up i will wait you will wait cried lisa out of all patience the colour rose to her cheeks and she clenched her hands over her white apron to restrain her quick words another person came in at the same moment it was madame lecoeur can you give me a mixed plate for fifty sous per pound she said pretending not to see her brother-in-law as she spoke afterward she gave him a careless nod and then scrutinized the three men hoping perhaps to discover from their expressions the wonderful secret they were discussing she saw that she was intruding but she enjoyed the knowledge which only made her more rigid and angular in her scanty skirts her spider-like arms and bony hands were folded under her apron she coughed slightly you have a cold said gavard in order to break the awkward silence she answered with a curt no her skin was brick red when it was stretched over her high cheekbones this and a certain odd look about her eyes and lids indicated some disease of the liver she turned to the counter watched by lisa who had not the most absolute faith in the honesty of her customer do not give me any of the brains said madame lecoeur i do not like them lisa had taken a sharp knife and cut some slices of sausage she then went to the smoked ham and to that which was only salted and took off some delicate pieces her white dimpled hands performed their task deftly she lifted a cover and said do you want some of the larded veal madame lecoeur deliberated for a few moments upon this weighty point and then nodded an assent lisa took out a slice of larded veal and then of a pate of hare's feet and she laid each slice on the paper on the scales you have not given me any of the boar's head au pistache said madame lecoeur in her disagreeable voice lisa was willing to give some of the boar's head but when the woman insisted on two slices of galantine she became impatient and told her frankly that the galantine had truffles and she could only add it to the mixed plates which she sold at a higher price when the things were weighed the woman insisted on a slice of jelly and some pickled cucumbers which lisa with hands trembling with indignation added impatiently it is twenty-five sous i believe said madame lecoeur enjoying lisa's irritation and slowly pulling out her sous from her pocket and glaring at gavard who was swearing under his breath at her prolonged stay at last she departed with one long lingering look as soon as she had gone lisa burst out and la sagesse sent her too i wonder if that old woman intends to send all the hall here to find out what we are saying how silly they are who ever heard of buying such things as breaded cutlets and mixed plates at this hour but they would rather give themselves a fit of indigestion than not know but if la sagesse ends in any one else you will see what i will do End of chapter 2, part 2this librivox recording is in the public domain the miser's treasure part three before lisa's anger the two men were silent gavard was playing with a bit of the railing around the counter he said slowly to florent 
don't you see that these scamps have nearly starved you very well now let them feed you this idea delights me florent smiled but still shook his head quenu to please his wife uttered a few faint words of entreaty but lisa did not seem to hear she was looking intently out toward the hall suddenly she exclaimed ah they have sent la normande now very well la normande shall pay for all the others a tall brunette entered the door it was the pretty fishwoman louise mehuden known as la normande there was a touch of boldness in her beauty although her skin was very pale and delicate she was as tall as lisa but her bust was fuller she entered in an off-hand sort of way with a gold chain dangling over her apron her hair fashionably dressed and a knot of lace and ribbon at her throat she brought with her a fresh salt odour almost like the sea and had on one of her hands a herring scale which caught the light like an opal the two women had been intimate friends for a long time although they were also rivals they called one la belle normande the other la belle lisa and instituted constant comparisons between the two lisa where she stood could see the fishwoman among her salmon and turbots the two women watched each other closely la belle lisa drew her corset lacing tighter la belle normande added rings to her fingers and ribbons to her dress when the two met they were very sweet and very complimentary each watching the other furtively and taking in the detail of the costume worn by the other is it to-morrow that you make your black pudding asked la normande gaily lisa was slow to anger but not easily soothed she answered yes in one brief monosyllable because continued the other i adore it when it is hot i shall come for some she realized the lack of cordiality in her rival's manner she looked at florent with an air of interest then as she did not wish to depart without saying something she had the rashness to add the last i bought of you was not fresh not fresh answered the mistress of the establishment white with indignation she might have restrained herself but for that knot of ribbon was it not enough she thought that she must be spied and watched she must also be insulted she placed her hands on her counter and in a voice that was hoarse with anger she said slowly tell me last week when you sold me a pair of soles did i say before everybody that they smelled badly smelled badly my soles cried the fishwoman flushed and breathless the two women fairly glared at each other all their beautiful friendship had vanished a word sufficed to show their sharp teeth under their smiles you are an insulting creature said la belle normande if ever i put my foot here again you will know it all right answered la belle lisa the fishwoman went out uttering a sentence which left lisa trembling the scene passed so rapidly that the three men had no time to interfere lisa soon regained her self-control and entered into conversation without making any allusion to what had taken place she told gavard that he had best say nothing to m valoque for two or three days quenu went back to his kitchen and gavard took florent off with him to get a glass of vermouth they saw in the distance three women madame lecoeur mademoiselle sagette and la sarriette talking together very busily the old maid was holding forth as i was telling you madame lecoeur your brother-in-law is for ever in their shop you have seen him have you not oh certainly he was sitting on a table i interrupted la sarriette i could not hear one word i can't imagine what you expected me to hear mademoiselle saget shrugged her shoulders you have no idea i suppose why these people are so very attentive to monsieur gavard in my opinion they mean him to leave all he possesses to little pauline do you think that cried madame lecoeur turning pale then in a gasping tone as if she had received a dagger thrust she said i am all alone this man can do of course just as he pleases his niece and he are good friends she has already forgotten what she has cost me no indeed aunt said la sarriette i have forgotten nothing it is you who have never had anything but harsh words for me they were at once reconciled the niece promised to be more considerate and the aunt swore that she regarded sarriette as her own daughter 
then mademoiselle proceeded to give them advice as to the manner in which they should behave to prevent gavard from wasting his property it was decided that the quenu gradel did not amount to much and they had best be carefully watched something is going on said the old lady but what i can't yet tell this florent this cousin of madame quenu's what do you think of him the three women put their heads close together you know very well said le coeur that we saw him one morning with holes in his shoes and ragged clothes all covered with dust he really frightens me nonsense murmured la sarriette he is thin very thin but he is a good man all the same mademoiselle saget reflected i have been trying to find this out for a fortnight i am certain that monsieur gavard knew him in fact i feel as if i had seen him somewhere she was still cudgelling her memory when la normande swept down upon them like an avalanche she is a civil creature certainly that quenu woman she cried will you believe that she told me that i sold stinking fish just think of that while their own spoiled pork poisons everybody what did you say to her asked the old woman delighted to hear that the two friends had quarrelled i nothing not a word i just went in to engage some pudding for to-morrow night and she insulted me miserable hypocrite with all her mild airs but she shall pay more dearly for this than she thinks for the three women felt instinctively that la normande was not telling the truth but they were none the less ready to espouse her quarrel they turned up la rue rambuteau busy with the invention of some story which should injure the canus but what did the cousin say asked mademoiselle saget the cousin answered la normande sharply you believe in that cousin do you he is much more likely to be a lover the three others exclaimed at this for lisa's propriety of conduct had passed into a proverb in the quartier oh i mean what i say these women who have that touch-me-not look are no better than others let me tell you mademoiselle saget nodded as if to say that she agreed with this opinion she said insinuatingly to be sure this cousin seems to have fallen from the skies and the canoe's account of him does not hang together very well he is her lover i tell you reiterated the fishwoman some fellow she has picked up in the street she has given him an entire new suit of clothes said madame lecoeur he must cost her a pretty penny the woman immediately began to discuss all that went on in the quenu gradel menage madame lecoeur declared that she would open her brother's eyes in regard to the character of the house he frequented la normande grew a little calmer and ashamed of what she had said left her friends abruptly when she had departed madame lecoeur said i am sure that la normande was insolent for it is a way she has she had best not speak of lisa's cousin for people will be apt to remember that she found a baby one fine morning in her fish stall they looked at each other and laughed when madame lecoeur left in her turn la sarriette said i wish my aunt would let all these people alone she grows thin fussing about her neighbor's affairs she always beat me if a man looked at me but she need have no fear she will never find any brat under her bed mademoiselle saget laughed delightedly and when she was alone she said half aloud that these people were not worth the cord to hang them with she hurried down the street until she reached the bakery kept by a certain madame taboureau who was a handsome woman and a friend of lisa's also a great authority on all subjects when any one said madame taboureau said this madame taboureau said that there was no further discussion mademoiselle saget inquired when the oven would be hot that she might have a dish of pears baked and then said many nice things of lisa extolling her exquisite neatness and the superiority of all the things she sold at her shop then quite pleased with this moral alibi and enchanted at the coming battle which sniffed afar off she started home her mind dwelling pertinaciously on the image of madame quenu's cousin that same evening after dinner florent went out and walked for some time in one of the covered streets of the halles a fine fog was rising filling the empty places with a grey sadness pierced at intervals with the yellow gas for the first time he felt himself to be in the way 
he realized the inopportune fashion in which he had fallen into this fat and comfortable little circle he said to himself that he had disturbed the whole quartier that he embarrassed his brother and his brother's wife and that they found it difficult to carry their contraband cousin these reflections rendered him very sad not that he felt his brother or lisa to be unkind in any way he thought them only too kind but he accused himself of a want of delicacy in quartering himself upon them doubts disturbed him the recollection of the conversation in the shop made him uncomfortable although he did not know precisely why perhaps he was wrong in refusing the position which had been offered this thought was bitter to him and he wondered if he should be compelled to act contrary to his convictions here a damp blast of wind compelled him to button his overcoat and blew away the enervating atmosphere of the luxurious eating-house with which his garments were filled he turned to go home when he met claude lantier face to face the painter buttoned to the chin in his shabby coat was in a state of great rage he swore that his life was that of a dog and that he would never touch a pencil again as long as he lived that afternoon he had kicked a hole through a study he had made of cadine's head he was subject to these attacks common to all artists who feel their inability to execute the works of which they dream at such times he wandered like a madman through the streets saw everything through a glass darkly dreamed that the end of all was at hand and looked forward to the morrow as to a resurrection laurent with difficulty recognized the gay planeur whom he had met on that memorable morning on his arrival in paris and seen often since claude knew his history and was always cordial when they chanced to meet but he rarely went to the canoes you are still at my aunt's said claude well it passes my comprehension how you can stand that smell of cooking if i stay there an hour i feel as if i were overfed and had eaten enough for three days i made a mistake in going in there to-day i lost an hour or two after a moment's silence he continued they are good people too but they look so well and hearty that they really make me uncomfortable they wanted me to paint their pictures but how on earth can i draw faces in which there is not a bone aunt lisa would never have been as silly as i have been to-day and now i think of it i don't believe that head was so bad after all then they talked of aunt lisa claude said that his mother rarely saw her now he believed that lisa was a little ashamed that her sister should have married a common working man besides she had little sympathy for people who were unfortunate as for himself he had had one stroke of luck a good man had fallen in love with him a child of eight and with the animals and figures he drew and had sent him to school and when he died had left him a small yearly income of a thousand francs which at least prevented him from starving but i wish nevertheless he continued that i had learned a trade that of a cabinet maker for example they are a happy class they have a table to make they make it and they go to bed glad they have finished their work and perfectly satisfied with it and themselves now i never sleep at night all these confounded studies i have made buzz about in my head i am never done never at rest his voice broke he tried to laugh and then uttered an oath trying to find the most atrocious language with the wild rage of a man whose nature is delicate and refined but who feels that he has made a great mistake of life suddenly he stopped short and pointed down into one of the cellars of the hall where a gas light was kept burning continually he had caught a glimpse of marjolin and cadine calmly sleeping these scamps had found a way to enter these places after the gratings had been put down now look at that animal cried claude did you ever see more perfect animal beauty and in the voice of the painter there was a tone of absolute envy they are happy as pigs they make their supper off of apples and then they go to sleep in one of those baskets full of chicken feathers after all you have done well perhaps to stay at aunt lisa's you can't help growing fat there and he walked off sulkily florent went up to his attic restless and uncertain the next day he went out early and took a long walk at breakfast he was greatly comforted by lisa's gentleness she spoke of the place which had been offered to him but very quietly as of a matter which required consideration 
he listened leaving his untouched plate before him he was carried away by the dazzling cleanliness of the room by the softness of the mat under his feet by the fresh paper and glittering varnish he wondered what was true and what was false yet he had strength to repeat his refusal at the same time quite conscious of the bad taste of which he was guilty in making such a brutal display of his resentments and rancour in such a peaceful comfortable spot as this lisa was not angry she smiled with that lovely smile which embarrassed florent even more than her irritation of the previous evening at dinner they talked only of the immense amount of labour which would be necessary to get in all their winter stock the evenings were now cold as soon as they had dined they went into the kitchen where it was always warm and so large that a number of persons could be comfortable there around a square table placed in the centre the walls of the room were covered with plaques and blue faience on the left was the great furnace with its three holes in which stood three pots blackened with soot and constant use and further off was a little stove where all the broiling was done and above was a row of shelves on which stood or hung long-handled spoons strainers skimmers colanders and row upon row of drawers all labelled wherein were kept bread-crumbs coarse and fine mustard pepper and salt spices cloves and nutmegs on the right was the chopping-table an enormous block of oak against the wall all seamed and scarred while several machines whose uses were unknown to a casual observer stood near by their wheels and their general aspect giving a look of diabolical mystery to the place piles of saucepans of tin and copper stood in every corner all delicately clean small saws and larding needles hung side by side in spite of the absolute cleanliness of the place there was a smell of grease which permeated the very walls and reddened the bricks on the floor and polished the edges of the chopping block until it looked as if it had been varnished and it seemed as if in this constant evaporation from the three pots where so many pigs had been boiled that from every nail in the room and every plank in the wall oozed grease the quenu gradel did everything themselves they bought nothing except sardines cheeses conserves and pates from a celebrated house consequently september to them was a busy month they then filled the cellar which they had emptied during the summer quenu assisted by auguste and leon made his sausages prepared his hams and rendered his lard there was a formidable noise of frying and sizzling of chopping and pounding and the smell of cooking filled the whole neighbourhood the night of which we write it was late eleven o'clock quenu who had been busy with two huge pots of lard now occupied himself with the pudding auguste was helping him at the corner of the table lisa and augustine were mending linen while opposite florent was playing with little pauline leon was chopping meat for sausages with slow and regular blows auguste went to the courtyard and brought in two huge jugs of hog's blood it was auguste who killed the animals at the abattoir and brought the blood home himself leaving the carcasses to be dressed and sent home in the regular wagons quenu declared that there was no one in paris who knew the quality of pig's blood as did auguste if auguste said the pudding will be good the pudding was good how will it be to-night asked lisa i think it will be excellent madame i can tell by the way the blood runs when i pull out the knife if the blood runs slowly it is not a good sign it shows that the blood is poor but interrupted quenu that all depends on how deep you put in the knife auguste's pale fat face relaxed into a smile no he answered i always put my knife in three fingers deep that is the rule the blood should be thick while it is warm but not coagulated augustine dropped her needle and looked at her future husband with fixed attention her suffused face with its close bands of chestnut hair was full of interest even little pauline listened i beat it up with my hand continued the young man moving his fingers as if he were beating a syllabub then i look at my hand and it must be the same colour all over with a greasy look then i say to myself yes it will be a good pudding he looked at his hand complacently this hand which was so constantly thrust into buckets of blood was pink and delicate with polished nails quenu nodded leon chopped on pauline climbed on her cousin's knees tell me the story she cried of the gentleman who was eaten by the beasts 
this talk about the blood had apparently awakened in the child's mind the remembrance of this story florent did not understand but lisa laughed don't you remember what you were telling gavard one night the child must have heard you florent became very grave the child took in her arms the huge yellow cat and put it on her cousin's knees saying that monton wished to hear the story but monton jumped on the table and sat there with back well up watching the tall thin man who for the last two weeks had apparently afforded him much food for reflection pauline kicked and plunged in her impatience to hear the story pray tell her said lisa and she may let us have some peace florent sat with his eyes fixed on the ground he slowly raised them looked first at the two women placidly sewing and then at quenu and auguste who were scalding a pot for the pudding the gas burned evenly the heat of the furnace was very delightful and the aspect of the room one of intense comfort florent lifted pauline and as he placed her on his knees began to talk to her there was once a very poor man he was sent far away to the other side of the sea upon the ship which took him away there were four hundred forçats with whom he was to live five weeks he was devoured by fleas and killed by the heat and bad air fifty were allowed to go on deck at a time and two cannons were brought to bear full on them for no little fear was felt of these men the poor fellow i am telling you about was very happy when it came his turn he had lost his appetite and could not sleep and at night when he thought he could not be heard he wept his eyes out pauline listened with wide open eyes and hands closely folded that is not the story i mean she said not the story of the man who was eaten by the beasts wait said florent gently i am coming to it go on murmured the child in a contented tone then her little forehead contracted and with a puzzled air she said but what had the poor man done that they sent him away in the big boat lisa and augustine smiled the child's quick intelligence delighted them lisa took advantage of the circumstance to point a moral she said that children too were sent away in the boat if they were not good then remarked pauline judiciously my cousin's poor man was very wise to cry in the night when no one could see him lisa lifted her eyebrows and went on with her sewing some onions were slowly frying on the fire with a contented little noise like that made by crickets basking in the heat and leon had not finished his chopping when they arrived continued florent they took the man to an island called l'île du diable and there he found some friends who had also been driven from their country they were miserable and obliged to work like convicts they were counted three times each day by the guard to be sure they were all there at night they were shut up in a great barn-like building of wood at the end of a year they were nearly naked and went barefoot they had built huts out of logs to shelter them from the heat of the sun which is terrific there but the huts could not keep out mosquitoes several died and the others were so thin and yellow that they were enough to frighten any one auguste give me the lard cried quenu and when he held the dish he dropped some of the lard slowly into the pot but didn't they have anything to eat asked the child profoundly interested yes they had rice full of worms and meat that smelt badly answered florent in a sombre voice they had to pick out the worms to get at the rice and the meat made the mill but i should sooner have eaten dry bread said the child contemplatively leon having finished his chopping put the platter containing the sausage meat on the table monton was obliged to move which he did with a very bad grace lisa made no attempt to conceal the disgust she felt the worms in the rice and the ill-smelling meat seemed in her eyes to dishonour the man who had been compelled to eat them there was almost a look of terror in her fair face as she contemplated the man who had been exposed to such horrors it was not certainly a delightful spot in which to reside said florent forgetting the child on his knee and speaking with intense bitterness each day there were new vexations new violations of justice new contempt for all human decency and charity which exasperated the prisoners to a fever of vindictive rancour 
they lived like wild beasts in a cage with the whip constantly upheld over them such sufferings cannot be forgiven nor yet forgotten his voice dropped and the lard and the onions sizzled gaily but lisa was startled at the ferocious expression of his countenance and wondered if all his gentleness were altogether feigned and if he were a hypocrite after all but this fierce intonation in florent's voice was delightful to pauline she gave a frantic jump on her cousin's knee but the man cousin tell me about the man florent looked down at the little one and smiled sadly the man he said did not like the island and he determined to cross the sea to reach the land which could be seen on fair days but this was not so easy for he must build a raft and where was he to get any wood the island was fairly stripped and baked in the hot sun for all the trees had been cut down for the use of the prisoners the man finally determined to use the logs of which their huts were constructed and one evening he and two of his comrades started forth the wind blew them straight where they wished to go day was breaking when their poor raft ran on a sandbank and came to pieces the three poor fellows were in the sand up to their waists and finally one went down to his chin and the others pulled him out with infinite difficulty they reached a rock where they had barely place to sit when the sun rose they saw opposite them a line of bleak rocks two who could swim determined to make an effort to reach these rocks they preferred to drown rather than die of starvation they promised their companion that if they lived they would return for him with a boat ah now i know cried pauline clapping her hands you have got to my story of the gentleman who was eaten by beasts they reached the rocks continued florent but they were deserted and they found no boat for four days when they went back to the sandbank they found their companion lying there with his feet and hands devoured his intestines eaten away and the cavity occupied by crabs which were eating their way all through the body lisa and augustine uttered an exclamation of loathing leon who was cutting some thin slivers of pork for the pudding made a hideous face auguste and quenu were positively ill pauline laughed vociferously give me that blood cried quenu at last auguste brought it and poured it slowly into the pot while quenu stirred vigorously and when it was all in took down some spices the odour of which filled the kitchen they left him there of course said lisa and how did they get away as they came of course answered florent but the wind rose and the waves were something terrible the water washed over them and they emptied the boat with their hands this lasted for three days and they had not one mouthful to eat three days cried lisa starving for three days yes and when the wind at last changed and drove them to the shore one was so worn out that he died in a few hours his companions tried to make him eat the leaves of the trees as they did themselves here augustine laughed and then in her confusion unwilling that they should think her hard-hearted she stammered it was not at that madame i laughed it was at moton look at him madame lisa laughed in her turn moton had gotten up stretched his lazy length and then began to scratch the table furiously as if he wished to cover up the platter of sausage meat he then leisurely turned round and lay down with half-shut eyes then everybody praised monton everybody said that he never stole a mouthful and pauline told how after dinner he always licked her fingers lisa came back to the question of how a man could live three days without eating i do not believe it she said it is utterly impossible i often hear that such and such a person is starving but it is her mere façon de parler everybody eats more or less there may of course be occasionally some she was about to say some poor wretch but she checked herself as she looked at florent her eyes clearly said however that only utterly disreputable persons could ever be exposed to such contingencies florent felt as if he were choking the heat of the room was intense and the smell of cooking overpowering when the man had buried his comrade in the sand resumed florent he went away all alone dutch guiana where he was is a country of forests and rivers 
the man wandered about for a week without seeing a human being he dared not eat the glowing fruits he saw for he felt they were poisonous for entire days he walked under an arch of thickly interwoven branches with never a gleam of the blue sky above the green shadows were full of terror great birds flew over his head with a rush of wings and sudden cries like agonized shrieks monkeys chattered above his head or leaped from branch to branch serpents glided among the dry leaves and he saw slender heads and forked tongues among the monstrous roots certain damp corners were heaped high with moving things black yellow brown like dead leaves who disappeared with a rustle as he drew near his nights were full of horror and he felt stifled among all the trees the heat aggravated by the dampness was intolerable at last he beheld the sky again and stood on the margin of a broad river huge crocodiles bathed in the sun but even these were more reassuring than the forest he had passed through he succeeded in getting across the river only to find almost impassable forests again then came grassy plains with rank vegetation then a marsh in which he sank to his chin the moon was rising and after struggling out of the mud he lay for an hour or two without moving when at last he reached a habitation he was so pitiable a sight that every one was afraid of him they threw him something to eat but the master of the house guarded his door with a gun florent's voice broke he looked about him pauline had fallen asleep after many efforts to keep her eyes open quenu had lost his temper don't you know how to hold a gut he cried to leon will you never learn now stand steady leon with his right hand raised a long empty gut in the end of which a wide funnel had been placed quenu filled the gut and pressed in the mixture he had prepared tied strings around both ends and dropped it into the pot lisa looked on with great interest at this operation and her husband sighed with relief that his labors were at last over and the man the man murmured little pauline opening her eyes in surprise missing the sounds of her cousin's voice florent rocked her on his knee and went on as if he were an old nurse and then the man got to a great town where he was at first supposed to be an escaped convict and was put in prison for several months when he was released he tried to find employment he taught children to read and did any little things he could this man was determined to go home to his own country and had saved his money for that when he was taken down by yellow fever they thought him dead and they divided his clothes and when he was better he had not a shirt to put on he was compelled to begin at the beginning the man was very sick but he got better the man got well and the man got away Laurent's voice grew lower and lower and at last became inaudible though his pale lips continued to move pauline still slept lulled by his voice and her head rested on the shoulder of her cousin who held her in his arms and rocked her to and fro in a sweet and tender sort of way it was time now for quenu to take out the puddings this he did with a stick and carried them one by one into the courtyard where he hung them all up to dry leon helped him holding the ends of the puddings when they were very long the steam coming from the kettles which quenu had left uncovered filled the kitchen and lisa and augustine were as oppressed as if they had eaten too hearty a meal augustine carried pauline upstairs quenu who liked to shut up the kitchen himself dismissed auguste and leon the apprentice went off sulkily for he had stolen half a yard of pudding which he intended to broil then the quenus and florent remained alone and silent lisa ate a mouthful or two of the pudding it is good she said excellent i wonder what la normande will say about this some one knocked and gavard came in he always remained with monsieur le bigre until midnight he had now come for a positive reply in regard to the position he had obtained for florent monsieur valoc he said can wait no longer he is really too ill florent must decide i have promised an answer to-morrow at an early hour florent accepts said lisa quietly taking another nibble at her pudding florent in vain tried to protest no no continued lisa you have suffered enough my dear florent 
you make me shudder when you tell such terrible stories it is time that you settle down you belong to an honourable family you have received a good education and it really is not proper to roam the streets like a beggar you are too old for such childishness you have sown your wild oats and they are forgotten and forgiven you must return to the position to which you are entitled and live like the rest of us florent listened but in his astonishment could not find a word to say she was right of course how could she be otherwise this woman with her healthy tranquil face he of course was the one in the wrong he with his bent figure and emaciated countenance he wondered even that he had dreamed of resistance but she continued lecturing him in a maternal fashion and bringing forward the most convincing arguments do this for us florent she said we are looked up to here in the quartier and i am afraid that people are beginning to chatter this place will make them hold their tongues and you will be an honour to us she became caressing a gentle lassitude took possession of florent he was weighed down so to speak by the substantial odours with which the air of the kitchen was laden he was carried away by the comfort and plenitude of the life he had lived for the last fortnight and the bitterness he had felt his keen indignation and burning desire for vengeance were smouldering he seemed to have no other aim than to spend a series of just such evenings all through life but it was monton after all who turned the scales monton slept so profoundly with his tail curled up against his back and looked so deliciously happy that florent murmured as he looked at him and why not after all i accept gavard yes i accept then lisa finished her pudding and dried her fingers she lighted a candle for her brother-in-law and stood with it in her hand the light falling on her lovely face which had all the tranquillity of a sacred cow End of chapter two chapter three part one of the markets of paris by emile zola this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter three the handsome fishwoman part one three days later and all was arranged the city government accepted the temporary substitute offered by m valoque without question when florent first presented himself at the prefecture gavard volunteered to go with him and when he was with florent again in the street he gave the latter several jocose digs in the side and winked impetuously the policemen all seemed to him a huge joke for as he passed them he drew down the corners of his mouth as if it were with difficulty that he repressed a laugh the next day m valoque initiated his successor in the details of his duties and for several mornings guided him through the turbulent little world wherein he was now to spend his days this poor valoque as gavard called him was a small sickly-looking man with a perpetual cough wrapped up in flannel and with a silk handkerchief around his throat he tottered about the markets with the aid of a cane the first morning florent was literally deafened by the noise around the auction benches crowded the retail dealers while the employés arrived with their registers and the agents of the shippers carrying huge leather bags over their shoulders sat waiting with their chairs tipped up on their back legs against the wall the fish was unpacked in the little enclosure while along the sidewalk there were perpetual arrivals of small installments bags dripping with water were perpetually pitched down men were hastily tearing off the straw from the crates and emptying them and rearranging the contents on the shallow baskets in the most advantageous manner it seemed to florent that a whole school of fish had backed up against the wall their shining scales and pearly oysters and violet-tinted mussels recalled all the soft tints of the ocean the sea had given up all its treasures cod swordfish plaice mudfish of a dirty grey with white spots eels deep blue in tone with narrow black eyes skates whose white bellies were bordered with pale pink and along the back of which on the protruding spine up to the gills were dashes of cinnabar striped with florentine bronze and fading off into the dark brown of a toad hound fish with their horrible heads their mouths huge like chinese idols their short wings like those of bats monsters who guard marine grottoes at last came the fine handsome fish each alone on an osier tray salmon of rosy silver every scale of which looked as if touched by a graver's tool 
mullets with larger scales turbots and brills white and firm as curdled milk tunnies smooth and varnished like black leather soles painted on all sides gray and white herring with their bloody gills fat goldfish spotted with carmine while mackerel their backs marked with brownish green and their bellies like mother of pearl lay with heads all toward the centre of the basket there were also sir mullets red dashed with brown boxes of whiting reflecting the light like opals baskets of smelts clean little baskets as pretty as baskets of strawberries rosy shrimp gray prawns lobsters spotted with black still living and reaching out their claws in a helpless sort of fashion florent listened to the explanations of m valoque a streak of sunshine came athwart the scene lighting up all the lovely hues of these strange creatures it was as if some sea nymph had opened all her jewel caskets and thrown them pell-mell on the ground necklaces and bracelets fantastic ornaments of all kinds heaped in one rich mass but florent caught a breath of the salt sea with which he was familiar he remembered that long guiana coast he remembered a bay where at low tide the seaweeds lay uncovered and smoked in the sunshine when the high rocks were drying and the wind blew strong from over the sea toward him the fresh fish exhaled the same keen smell m valoque coughed the dampness struck to his lungs and he pulled the handkerchief over his mouth now he said we will go on to the fresh water fish this was the last toward la rue rambuteau where stood immense tanks supplied by faucets with fresh water in slender threads in each tank there was a moving mass here m valoque coughed more the dampness was as great but there was a smell of moisture and of wet earth the amount of crabs from germany in boxes and baskets was very large that morning while fish from holland and england overcrowded the market there were carp from the rhine which were beautiful with their bronze metallic glitter and scales like cuissonne enamel huge pike those brigands of the river in their steel-gray garb tench sombre and magnificent like red copper spotted with fair degree there were trout and white bait large baskets of young carp were being emptied into the tank the fish turned over lay still a moment and then swam gaily off bags of small eels were turned out falling in one huge solid mass while the bigger ones disentangled themselves and slipped away with the supple movements of an adder hiding among the bushes fish were lying on the flat osier baskets who had been slowly dying ever since the morning they gasped and opened their mouths as if to drink in all the humidity of the air while their sides shook with an occasional hiccough meanwhile m valoque took florent further on all the time talking and giving him the needed information the crowd around the wire enclosures where sat the employés with their registers on high stools was rapidly becoming more dense Laurent was taken within one of these wire enclosures where sat the agent of the municipal custom house making entries in a huge book lower down there were two women writing at their small desks they kept the tallies the cashier was a stout woman who had piles of silver and copper before her there are two controllers here said Valoc, one representing the prefecture of the seine the other that of the prefecture of the police the latter nominates the factors and pretends to oversee them the administration of the city affects only those transactions on which they levy a tax he continued to talk in his little cold voice and had much to say of the quarrels of these two officials florent did not listen he was looking at a woman who sat at one of the desks she was a brunette about thirty with a dignified handsome face she was writing and held her pen like a lady he at that moment heard the crier who held up a magnificent turbot thirty francs he said thirty francs he repeated these two words in every imaginable tone he was a humpback and wore a blue apron he waved his arms wildly thirty-one thirty-two thirty-two fifty he stopped to take breath and pushed the osier basket forward some of the fishwomen leaned over and lightly touched the turbot then off the man went again seeing the smallest sign made by a bidder uplifted eyebrows parted lips or a wink and that with such rapidity that florent who could not follow him was perfectly astonished when the hunchback chanted forty-two forty-two going at forty-two it was la belle normande who made the last bid 
Florence saw her standing in the centre of the row of fishwomen. The morning was cool, and there was a great display of big white aprons and stout frames. The high chignon and crimps, the fresh clean skin of la belle Normande, made her very conspicuous among the bushy heads with coloured handkerchiefs knotted about them, and faces with swollen noses and impudent eyes. She had seen Madame Quenu's cousin, and was greatly surprised at his being there. The auctioneer continued to sell the fish, while the brunette wrote on rapidly. "'That man is magnificent,' said Monsieur Valoque, with a smile. "'He is the best seller in the market. Bless your heart. He would make you buy the soles of his boots for a pair of fish of the same name.' He said, as he passed the tanks of fresh-water fish, that if France did not take some active measures, her rivers and lakes would soon be depopulated. An auctioneer was here selling the eels and crabs by the lot the crowd grew larger valoque did his duty as inspector most conscientiously he pushed his way through the crowd until he reached the spot where the most rapid bidding was going on the larger purchasers were there with their porters ready to carry away the choice fish they bought there was also an occasional respectable bourgeois who tempted by the prospect of a fresh fish for breakfast had come down to the market at four o'clock and to his great amazement found himself the unintentional owner of forty or fifty francs worth of seafood which after it was knocked down he was compelled to entreat his friends to take off his hands there was no little quarrelling among the crowd and also rude elbowing florent at last said he had seen enough and as he emerged from the crowd he found himself face to face with la belle normande she said to m valoque with her air de reine then it is quite settled sir you leave us do you yes answered the little man i am going into the country for a while to clamart and this is the gentleman who takes my place la belle normande was dumbfounded and as florent went away he thought he heard her say in the ear of one of her friends now we will have some fun florent regretted already that he had yielded to lisa's entreaties as soon indeed as he was in the open air and shaken himself clear of the sleepy influence of the kitchen he accused himself of miserable cowardice almost with tears in his eyes but he dared not retract his promise for he was a little afraid of lisa he had detected a certain compression of the lips which boded ill for him should he venture to do this gavard inspired him with an idea that was not without its consolation he confided to him that valoque the poor devil needed money so much that it would be a real act of charity to allow him to keep a certain amount of the salary florent accepted this proposal with joy it seemed only right in his eyes besides he really needed so little himself as he slept in it with his brother gavard said that from the monthly salary of a hundred and fifty francs it would be as well to offer valoque fifty it could not be for very long after all as the poor man was in a galloping consumption it was agreed that florent should make the arrangement with the wife to avoid hurting valoque's pride florent assented but demanded a promise from the poultry vendor that no one should know of this and as gavard also stood in wholesome terror of lisa he kept the secret in a most meritorious way at last every one at the eating shop was content la belle lisa was more friendly than ever to her brother-in-law she sent him to bed early that he might wake in season she gave him a hot breakfast and was not ashamed to talk with him on the sidewalk now that he wore an official cap Quenu was charmed that things were going so smoothly they sat over their dinner often until nine o'clock while augustine was in charge of the counter during this time there was much gossip and many positive judgments uttered by the pork merchant and his wife florent was questioned about what went on at market and he soon began to enjoy the regularity of this dull but comfortable life but gavard declared that the Quenu gradelle's interior was too sleepy he forgave lisa for her tenderness to the emperor because he said it was foolish ever to talk politics with a woman he preferred to spend his evenings with monsieur le bigre where he met friends with opinions and he insisted on florent now that he was made inspector going with him monsieur le bigre had a fine establishment with all modern luxuries it stood at the opposite corner of la rue pirouette and was flanked with four small norway pines in green boxes and made a worthy pendant to the eating-house of the quenu gardels the large panes of glass allowed a full view of the interior papered in pale green and garlanded with grapevines the floor was in squares of black and white marble 
a winding staircase curtained with red led to the billiard room below but the counter on the right was very imposing with its display of silver gas lamps to keep wine and punch hot were at one end and at the other was a marble fountain much ornamented from which fell so continuous a stream of water that it looked almost as if it too were carved green bottles were cooling in the water while whole armies of glasses arranged in different sizes were near at hand small ones for brandy thick goblets absinthe glasses and saucers for brandied fruits tall vases served to hold any number of spoons generally m lebigre was enthroned behind the counter on an armchair covered with red leather close at his hand were liqueurs and decanters of cut glass jars of brandied fruits cherries prunes and peaches and between piles of toothsome biscuit were bottles filled with mysterious liqueurs like extracts from flowers so delicate with their hues of pale pink and clear yellow these bottles looked as if they were suspended in the air as the strong white light of the gas fell upon them to give to his establishment the air of a cafe m lebigre had placed opposite the counter against the wall two small tables and four chairs a chandelier with five burners and polished globes hung from the ceiling a round-faced clock was on the left there was in the rear a private room which had one window looking on la rue pirouette in the evening it was lighted by gas it was in this secluded retreat that gavard and his political friends met after their dinner every evening they considered themselves thoroughly at home there and no one was ever allowed to usurp their places or to intrude upon them the first day gavard gave some little account of m lebigre to florent he was a good man and an excellent man they had heard him say that he had suffered in forty eight he might seem stupid but he was not and these gentlemen as they passed his counter gave him a hearty shake of the hand over his glasses and decanters often by his side sat a little woman a girl whom he had taken as his assistant she was called rose and was sweet and submissive gavard with a wink insinuated to florent that she carried her submission to a very great length with the proprietor nevertheless all these gentlemen liked to be served by rose who went in and out as quietly as a shadow and seemed not to hear a word of their most stormy political discussions the day that gavard was to present florent to his friends they beheld on entering the private room an individual of about fifty with a doubtful hat and a much worn brown coat his chin was resting on an ivory-headed cane and his mouth was so buried in a full beard that his face seemed destitute of lips how are you robin asked gavard robin silently extended his hand he did not speak and hardly winked he replaced his chin on his cane and earnestly inspected florent who had sworn gavard to secrecy in regard to his story and was now disposed to believe that this promise had been broken and that this gentleman distrusted him but he was mistaken never did robin talk more than this he was always the first to enter the room and sat invariably in the same corner without once laying down his cane he sat listening to the others drinking only the one glass and that so imperceptibly that it lasted until midnight when florent some time later questioned gavard on robin he was told that this person was very shrewd but no reasons were given and no instances cited of this marvellous shrewdness it was roundly asserted however that he was one of the men of the opposition most dreaded by the government he lived in la rue saint denis but no one was ever known to have entered his rooms gavard stoutly asseverated that on one memorable occasion he had done so and had seen highly waxed floors and an alabaster clock with columns madame robin whose back only he had seen as he went in was very comme il faut and wore english curls unless he was greatly mistaken the menage was a peculiar one the husband had no business apparently he spent his days no one knew where lived no one knew how but appeared among them regularly each evening have you seen this address from the throne said gavard taking up a journal from the table robin shrugged his shoulders but the door opened wide and a hunchback entered the hunchback from the market a very different-looking person he was now however ah here comes logre said the poultry vendor he will tell us all the news and what he thinks of the speech from the throne 
but logre threw down his hat furiously and as he seated himself gave a pound on the table with his fist do you think i read their blasted lies he cried the hunchback was evidently much out of humour he soon found a victim rose rose he called going to the door of the cabinet and when the young woman appeared all in a tremble he said why do you stand looking at me you saw me come in and yet you do not trouble yourself to see what i want rose humbly apologized received the orders from logre and the other two men who soon had their glasses at their side where is charvet said one waiting for clemence outside was the reply but charvet appeared he was a tall bony fellow who lived near the luxembourg his hair was long and thrown back from his forehead he talked with a rapid flow of words which were so long and so erudite that his adversaries were generally floored gavard was afraid of him though he would not acknowledge it even to himself and always said when charvet was not there that he was utterly unendurable robin approved all that was said only with his eyelids logre was the only one in the little group who ventured to argue with this authoritative personage he and clemence had lived together as man and wife for ten years and as florent looked at the young woman he at last remembered where he had seen her she was the brunette whom he had seen writing in the fish market rose appeared on the heels of the newcomers she placed a glass before clemence also a plate with a lemon cut in halves clemence mixed her glass of grog herself pressing the lemon with a spoon and holding the decanter of rum up to the light to see that she did not take too much gavard presented florent to these gentlemen with an especial recommendation to charvet he said that they were both clever men who would understand each other they all shook hands with the newcomer in a peculiar sort of way suggestive of the masonic grip charvet showed himself quite amiable have you received your pay to-day asked logre of clemence she said yes and opened her pocket-book and showed it to him full of silver we must settle our accounts he said in a low voice certainly to-night i have breakfasted with you four times but then you know i lent you five francs last week florent in surprise turned away his head lest he should hear what was not intended for him clemence sipped her glass and leaned back against the wall and listened to the men talking politics gavard took up the paper and read in a manner which he attempted to make comic disjointed fragments from the speech from the throne spoken that morning at the opening of the chambers one phrase amused him excessively we are confident gentlemen relying as we do on your enlightened views and on the conservative sentiments of the country that we shall see the daily growth of public prosperity logre repeated this phrase and even imitated the nasal twang of the emperor prosperity is a very nice thing said charvet but there is a good deal of starvation nowadays business is at a standstill muttered gavard the discussion grew quite violent the legislative body was handled without gloves logre became quite excited stood up and gesticulated in much the same attitude in which he stood in the market and sold off a fine turbot charvet was quite reserved and smoked his pipe steadily when he did speak his voice rang through the room robin nodded an assent without taking his chin from the ivory of his cane finally the conversation turned upon women women said charvet are the equals of men there should be consequently no inseparable bonds to bind them together it should be a mere business partnership you agree with me clemence evidently she answered with her head against the wall and her eyes half closed florent saw through the half-open door mademoiselle saget at the counter she had drawn a bottle from under her apron and watched rose as the latter filled it with a mixture of raspberry cordial and brandy the bottle was handed to mademoiselle saget who then quickly concealed it under her apron and lingered to chat a little the establishment that night was especially brilliant and the old maid in her scanty black skirts was a strange blemish on the scene florent fancied she had seen him for ever since he had first entered the halle she had been on his heels he had often seen her with madame lecoeur or la sarriette watching him stealthily his appointment as inspector seemed to astonish these women greatly mademoiselle saget said a few words to rose and then turned to a table near the door of the private room where m lebigre was playing piquet with a customer shut the door florent 
said gavard roughly who detested the old maid lacaille who had joined the group meekly obeyed at midnight when the conference broke up lacaille said a few words in a low voice to le bigre who as he shook hands with him slipped four or five franc pieces into his hand and whispered you know it is twenty-two francs to-morrow do not forget also that you owe three days for the carriage let everything be paid up m le bigre wished these gentlemen good-night he was sleepy he said and his yawn disclosed his strong white teeth he bade rose put out the gas in the private room and turned away gavard was a little tipsy and stumbled as he went out florent left him at his own door and went up to his attic which he had learned to like very much augustine's presence still lingered in the room on the chimney were a hairpin or two a box of gilt pasteboard containing buttons and pastels an empty pomade pot which smelt of jasmine in the table drawer were a prayer book some needles and pins a spool of cotton also a tumbled copy of a key to dreams a summer dress white with yellow spots hung on a nail behind the door while on the board which did duty as a washstand behind the water pitcher was a dark spot where a bottle of bandoline had been tipped over florent was amused by the childishness of the key to dreams and the gilt boxes they took him back to his own youth he forgot augustine and fancied himself occupying the room of a dear sister who had left behind her something of her feminine presence he liked too to lean out of the window of his attic to this window was attached a narrow balcony with iron railings where augustine had kept a box of flowers which florent now that the nights had grown chilly took into the house he would remain for an hour or more looking out and enjoying the fresh air which came from the seine over the houses in la rue de rivoli below were the confused masses of the market roofs above a broad glimpse of the open sky here he thought with mingled pain and pleasure of the despairing years he had spent out of france at last with a shiver he would close his window and as he took off his coat feel that the eyes of the photographs of auguste and augustine were following his every movement the first weeks of florent's new employment were very painful he found a certain covert hostility la belle normande had sworn to avenge herself on la belle lisa and the cousin was a good opportunity the mahoudans had come from rouen the old mother still told how she arrived in paris with a few eels in a basket she married an employé at the custom house who died leaving her the mother of two little girls it was she who by her full figure and resplendent skin had won the title of la belle normande which her daughter had inherited the old woman had grown immensely stout and had never renounced the fashions of her youth she still wore a dress of large figured material and a yellow fichu the traditional costume of fishwomen and had also preserved the loud voice and arms akimbo and had the slang of the fish market at the end of her tongue she mourned over the loss of the marché des innocents spoke of the former rights of the dame des halles and told of visits paid to the market by the court in the reign of charles x and of louis philippe the ladies in silk dresses and with flowers in their hands mother mehuden as she was called had been for a long time the bearer of the banner in the association of the virgin in the processions in the church she wore a tulle cap with satin ribbons and held aloft with her swollen hands the golden standard from which floated a richly figured flag on which was embroidered a virgin mother mehuden it was rumoured had made a great fortune the two sisters were not especially good friends the youngest claire an indolent blonde had many complaints to make of her sister louise the mother surrendered her own stall to louise and installed claire among the fresh-water fish and although she called herself out of the business she wandered about the markets all day claire was a whimsical creature very gentle and yet always in a quarrel with those about her she was quietly obstinate and wilful with not the smallest idea of justice she often revolutionized the market making the prices higher or lower as she pleased without being able to say why herself she was nearly thirty and was beginning to grow a little heavy but at twenty-two she looked as claude lancier had said like a murillo and a most untidy murillo too with her slipshod shoes and her dress cut as if by a hatchet she was not in the least coquettish and was indeed quite contemptuous when louise appeared in her ribbons 
it was said that the son of a rich bookseller in the quartier had gone to a foreign land in despair at not being able to obtain a good word from her louise la belle normande was much more tender-hearted she was on the point of marrying an employé in the wheat market when the poor fellow's back was broken by the fall of a load of flour nevertheless she had a child some few months later and was politely spoken of as a widow the old fishwoman often said when my son-in-law was living these mahoudans were a power in the halle when m valoque had given florent every possible aid he gently intimated that he must manage several among the market women if he wished to live in peace he even suggested that an occasional little present would be by no means amiss an inspector is both a police officer and a justice of the peace keeping order and conciliating the differences arising between purchaser and seller florent unfitted by nature to play this role went too far whenever he exercised his authority and then too his constrained manner and sad face were much against him the tactics of la belle normande was to draw him into some quarrel as she had sworn that he should not keep his position a fortnight if that fat lisa thinks we are going to take up with her leavings she is greatly mistaken the man is hideous we have more taste than she after the morning's auctions when florent went through the markets he saw perfectly well that la belle normande wished to insult him when he passed her stall she laughed immoderately and generally turned the water from the faucets over the alley florent pretended not to see or hear one morning however war was declared that day when florent reached the stall occupied by la belle normande he perceived a most intolerable odour he saw fine salmon rosy perch turbots as white as cream mullets and soles and among these fish whose eyes were still bright was a large skate which was putrid and the flesh falling from the bones that skate must be thrown away said florent going up to the stall la belle normande laughed insolently he looked at her never had he seen her so gorgeous she seemed unusually tall as she stood on a box to protect her feet from the dampness her hair was carefully dressed and a gold chain hung over her breast and long gold rings from her ears he repeated quietly this skate cannot remain here he had not noticed mother mahoudan who was sitting on a chair in the corner she rose and coming forward she leaned with her hands on the marble slab and why said she why should she throw this fish away will you pay her for it End of chapter three part one